Hi, everyone. I'm Woody. And I'm Gus. So here I am again doing the intro. We're switching yes. it up a little on these because, <laughs> because these are some dual reactions and neither Gus nor myself have seen this at all. I don't even know what it's about. So what <laughs> I, 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 here's how much I know. And then that's going to be my intro. Some guy who I don't know who it is goes in a cave. I don't know which cave runs out of air in the cave and I presume finds an air pocket and survives. He That's, survived? So you I don't know, know that much? Oh, I don't even know if he survived. I'm oh, just okay. I, you're right. Good point. I don't I so, have no idea. So my intro is, I don't know a darn thing about this. Let's see what happens. <laughs> Let's do it. A diver entered the South Paquetta cave system with a friend and had no idea what a horrifying disaster he would experience. I will tell you what unfolded to cause the experienced diver Cisco to consider killing himself quickly with his cave knife rather than oh. dying slowly from running out of air in a deep underwater cave. If oh, you're boy. looking for scary stories to binge to, Where, you've come to the right place because I tell new stories multiple times a week about disastrous and chilling events. Let's start the story. Mid-morning on Saturday, April 15th, 2017, Cisco Garcia loaded oxygen tanks from his truck near the mouth of the Cova de Sepiqueta cave system. Cisco and his longtime cave diving friend, Guillem Mascaro, were planning to spend the day exploring the subaquatic cave system on the island of Malroca, Spain. Sepiqueta is a complicated dive Mallorca. site with numerous underground Love chambers one kilometer from the cave entrance. It is easy to get lost and something could go wrong and cause your death in this cave. This danger did not deter the two friends as they were determined to explore and to help future divers see this cave. They Dude, I'm just I'm just interrupting to say we need to go cave diving in Mallorca. Oh, I love. I don't Spain. even know what this cave looks like, but I'm in. Yeah, Spain is <laughs> awesome. I heard you say that. It's awesome in so many ways. The people, yes. the food, the Everything. the culture, the beauty. I've I've um, actually snow snow skied there. I've ice climbed there. I mean, it is an adventure place. So I'm in. Yes. Therefore, they plan to map a chamber deep inside the cave on this dive. Cisco Garcia started exploring caves when he was a boy. The area around his boyhood village was dotted with caves he could mm, easily explore on foot. Garcia and his friends Beautiful. would spend hours searching the labyrinths, sometimes missing meals because they were so busy exploring. As he grew older, he became passionate about scuba diving. Becoming a cave diver was the next logical step in his life. In 1994, he started training to cave dive and eventually became a geology teacher. Okay, I have to make a comment. Missing meals is a pretty big sacrifice. That's right. So, that, did you pick that up? We're missing meals to cave dive. For you and I, that, well, what, how many, I don't know about that. But like How many I, hours between meals? <laughs> like when you say missing meals. No, but, uh, but, but this is important also because we do get this comment once in a while, which is you have to be rich to be a cave diver. And we know cave divers. That we, I mean, we love diving with cave divers that are, live in like minimum wage. Um, and that's all they do is whatever money they can scrap, they cave dive. They don't go to parties. They don't have vices. They don't drink. They don't do drugs. No. All they do is but cave they dive. they do afterwards probably get that two for one Burger King special, that $5 oh, yeah. two for one. Or the, or the, you know, he knows who I'm talking about. The two for one wing nights. Uh, <laughs> you know, <laughs> over there in Mariana. Okay. Those are very popular. Oh, too yeah. as well. Oh, yeah. So, okay. but what I'm saying is, you don't have to be rich to okay. be a cave diver. Which got him closer to cave diving, and a trained speciologist, a scientist focused on the study of caves, to help explore that passion. Garcia is a part of a team of 13 speciologists that regularly explore, research, and map the underwater caves of Malroca, Spain. In a cave, oh, you have York. no escape when things go wrong. Therefore, the danger is a hundred x. For some mm, context, beautiful. cave diving is considered a technical type of diving that should never be attempted by anyone, not even an average open water or advanced recreational diver. Good According fact. to RAID, a Thank top you. scuba training agency, the number one cause of serious injury or death in cave diving is not gear failure, getting lost, becoming trapped, or running out of air. These are simply consequences of divers exceeding their limits of their personal training and experience. The most common emergencies for cave divers are small equipment issues like torches flooding, reels tangling, masks breaking, or navigational problems. All contingencies that can be managed with proper training, keeping calm, and team ethos. Having someone with you when you're diving definitely helps out. Even the most experienced divers die from small mistakes or equipment failure. And, and redundant we say, gear. And we say that often, having somebody with you is a 
is a very uh, big attribute towards protecting you from some of these risks. We, yep. we believe that. A That's quick true. background on something that is really important in this story is in regards to turbidity and air supply. Cave environments are unique ecologically, and a limited amount of light is able to be seen inside the cave across any condition. Continuous guidelines to the surface help divers avoid getting lost, especially during times of sudden or limited visibility. Packable buoyancy controls ensure that a there's a stable environment, but this can also go wrong. A simple flutter kick or a fin can upswell silt and settlement, making it almost impossible to see anything around you, which is just horrifying, causing visibility to drop from crystal clear to near zero in seconds. I think Very this true. is cave divers worst fear. A diver's air consumption rate varies from one individual to the next, but this can be even more unpredictable in high stress environments. A sudden change in conditions or unforeseen issue can increase a diver's stress, causing the breathing rate to jeopardize the planned air supply. At the mouth of a cave, you have light, but as you go deeper inside the cave, the light eventually begins to fade, and soon you're met with pitch black. Your light could die, and you could take a wrong turn down an offshoot, you can get turned around. There's also the issue of sediment, like we talked hatch, about earlier, from the walls mucking up your visibility to just inches or zero. Trusting to see your way out of the cave is not viable. Thus, your only way out of the cave most times is with a dive line. But the line is not perfect. It can get caught on gear, trapping you. It can break. It can get caught on sharp things. Or it can also get tangled with the last guy's line. There's multiple lines that can be in a dive cave. And if your line gets tangled up with someone else's, you have no idea where that line is going, what direction it's going to lead you to. It could leave you deeper into the cave instead of out of it to safety. You never... Okay, that's not true. So... Let me see, where's my yep. cave arrow? I was going to comment. Uh, the yep. same comment, so go for it, I'm sure. So cave divers used markers on lines to tell us many things. Uh, one of them is which direction the exit is. We use a cave arrow. It looks like this. We thread it into the line, and it literally points to the exit. So if you're navigating on a line and you see the cave, let's say you're trying to get out, if the arrow is pointing to you as you're swimming, then that means the exit is that way and you're going the wrong way. So it's not like he's saying that you can easily just follow a line and get lost and keep going into the cave forever and not even know where you're going. No, we use arrows for that. And we also use cookies at times for that. Yep. Cookies are a non-directional marker, but when we put a jump line in, so we're jumping from a main line to another line, we'll put a marker, just call it a marker, we call them cookies, on the exit side of that jump. So if we had to come out blind, we would reach and we're like, oh, there's my cookie, so I know that's the exit side and I would follow that direction. Correct. Or no, it's a huge risk. There's an entire debate on using lines when cave diving. Another thing to consider really? is the environment. There's no debate. Water composition may change and the cave may connect to other points in the ground. Current is a huge variable because even the smallest amount of ocean activity can force water at high pressure into a narrow space. If the By the way, look at that cracked clay below him. Awesome. So that means that was dry. Yep. I mean, how else did it crack? So isn't that cool that that's been totally preserved as and nobody's clay messing with it. during the dry period of this cave? That's so cool. This happens. There's a crazy amount of water that can just rush in at any time and completely change the situations of the cave. If the cave is not filled with water, there can also be air that is toxic. You breathe this air, you can die immediately. Besides these dangers, there's always a wall to smack into or something sharp that can stick you while you're diving. Another thing to consider is your gear. If you're just taking a quick glance inside a cave, you don't need much. But if you're actually going to do a dive, you need a technical rig. And this, these rigs have a lot of different components that can go wrong. I mean, just a simple thing is your gas gauge could be off and that could cause severe problems when you're inside that cave. Not to mention oh, physiological issues of if you have a panic attack, Open then you're going to have maybe. a long, hard way out of the cave. And perhaps above all else, caves are deceivingly tempting. Malroca is one of the best places for diving in the Mediterranean. Mallorca. There are many research. This guy does a very good job at narrating, by the way, yeah. I think. this is a, We've done a couple now with him narrating. He's very yeah. clear and the story flows logically and he factually is very or technically very very uh very good overall Compared with so the, the other underwater ones flora and fauna system are very rich the best period for diving in malroca is from may to october cisco had been cave diving as a hobby for more than 20 years cisco routinely dived at malroca okay he keeps me saying mallorca but did you hear the dive season is may to october what are we doing dude it's june 
Let's make it happen. I, I mean, I'm in your basement, and I would rather be there. All right. That's, that's, that's what most I'm begins doing. exploring and mapping the island's complex cave systems and underwater caves. La Roca is much more beautiful underground than it is above ground, says what? Cisco. Cisco and his die buddy, Guillaume, wanted to explore some Paquita cave with numerous chambers one kilometer from the entrance to the labyrinth. Guillaume was a willowy 54-year-old local man and had been diving for decades. He started exploring caves in 2003. He was glad to be diving with Cisco, who was also one of the most experienced cave divers on Mel Roca. Cisco unfolded the map and pointed to an area about 90 meters from mm. the cave's entrance. Mm -hmm. These are the underwater chambers Look that have never that. been mapped before. Cisco was silk. dying to map these chambers. He was Gorgeous. excited and thought he would if be seeing real. for the first time. These are some yeah. of the most beautiful caves in the world. Dan Bear greeted the two men Looks like as it. they entered the cave around 12 p.m. Saturday and passed into darkness. Cisco attached four bottles of air to his belt and passed three bottles to Gam. Satisfied that they had the right amount of air, enough to get in, explore, and return, plus an extra hour in case an emergency, Cisco put his regular to his mouth and lowered his head underwater. Gam followed. The diving partners use a simple, time-honored tool to move through the underwater maze. Thin, nylon guidelines flagged with numerous labels. If a tunnel forked, another line extended down the second passage. The snaking path Cisco and Guillaume were to follow split many ways, creating a maze of potential wrong turns, all indistinguishable from one another without the lines, markers, and the arrows they placed on each intersection that pointed to the exit. Cisco yep. noticed that the water was clear that morning and the markers were easily visible. This was a great sign. The two men moved forward, leaving a cloudy trail of churned up sediment in their wake. <laughs> After an hour of navigating the narrow <laughs> twisted tunnels, Cisco swam to an underwater room Virgin cave. and began collecting rock samples. Gam was measuring the shape and diameter of a nearby chamber. After about an hour, Cisco glanced at his air pressure gauges and saw that his tanks were a third empty. Grabbing Gam by the shoulders, Cisco pointed to his air pressure dials. It was time to get out of the cave. They started back the way they had come following the guideline through the muddy water with sediment they had kicked up on the journey in. At first, the passage was wide, but as they progressed, the walls closed until Cisco's bottles were dragging and catching. The contact kicked up even more sediment, which turned around them like a thick chocolatey soup. But the two divers followed the white cord hand over hand till they came to a rock wall where the line suddenly ended. Cisco fell for the next section on the line, but nothing. He indicated to Yem that he should go to a cave about 20 meters away, where he knew there was air and wait for him. He knew that air there wasn't perfect. It contained some carbon dioxide, but it was the nearest place to wait for him. Saving air in their tanks was important. Cisco continued to look for a guideline. He waved his hand in the abyss, and it appeared that a piece of rock where the guideline had been affixed to had broken off. Oh, this was a man. huge problem. Line off his crap. gloves and began feeling around the line in the dark cloud that swirled around him. He swam back. I don't know if it's line trapped. It broke off, so they just don't know where the line is anymore. It sounds like they tied it to something that was either on the side or maybe up near the ceiling, oh, and it broke, it he said. So the line fell down somewhere. So they just had no idea where that line was anymore, especially with all that silt. It could be buried under silt. Back and forth, hands touching the rock sediment, the visibility grew worse with every moment. After a short while, Cisco peered at his regulator and tensed. He didn't realize how long he had spent looking for the guideline. They only had about an hour of air each, and there was still a kilometer from the exit. Even if we find the right path, we might run out of air before we reach the surface. Mm -hmm. Cisco swam to the cave where Guillaume waited for him. When he brought his head out of the water, he saw that he was in a large lake in a cavernous room, some 80 meters long and 20 meters wide. Beyond the lake, he could see pointed rocks, some reaching high above the water surface. When he took a breath, he immediately realized that the air contained more carbon dioxide than he thought. It was high, maybe 2 or 3 percent, far more than the 0 0.03 percent present in regular air. He also knew that such a high concentration of carbon dioxide would have dire consequences yep. and cause an elevated heart rate, rapid heart breathing, headaches, hallucinations, paralysis, unconsciousness, and even death. Yes. This was a huge problem. Cisco and Gim climbed out of the water and onto the rocks in the pitch black dark room. There's another route to the surface, but it's a lot bigger, Cisco said, pointing out the path on the laminated map. The guidelines should be intact. Examining the tanks, Guillaume knew that there was only enough air for one of them to make it out. Guillaume was the smaller and quicker of the two, and he would use less air on the way out. Also, Cisco spent many days exploring underwater chambers with carbon dioxide saturated air, and knew how to slow his breath to reduce the amount of toxic gases he inhaled. Guillaume suited up with the remaining tanks. Cisco watched as he disappeared beneath the surface. He hoped to see Guillaume again, drawing a shallow breath, but he really wasn't sure. So at this point, Guillaume decides to take off for the cave entrance, and Cisco wants to take 
take a look at his surroundings and figure out what kind of situation he's in. He pulls himself up on a big flat rock and he realizes that the air pocket is surprisingly large. Why, why is he, I'm confused, why is he able to know where the cave entrance is? Why didn't they both go there? Because the other guy was just too low on air? I guess so. I thought that was the problem is they lost, they got lost. I yeah. thought that's why they had to come up here. I'm a little uh, confused that, on that's that. That's unclear. About 80 meters by 20 meters wide with about a 12 foot meter gap between the water and the ceiling. The chamber's large size meant that Garcia had some chance of survival. Theoretically, he could wait a significant amount of time and he would still have enough air to breathe if he waited and was breathing correctly using his techniques that he's built up over the years for breathing in carbon dioxide rich environments. But his chance of survival depended completely on something that was totally out of his control. Guillem had to make it out of the cave. If he didn't make it out of the cave, Cisco was dead. He 100% had to rely on Guillem and his abilities. If Guillem made a mistake, he was dead as well, not just Cisco. The cave was completely dark. While searching for a possible exit, Cisco finally found some fresh water. It okay. didn't look great, but it was drinkable as time went on. So then that cleared it up a little bit. He was searching for the exit. They, they he did not know where the exit was. Like earlier, it indicated that he was going to swim towards the exit. He no, right. he's just going to go for it. Hopefully, find the exit. Yep. Okay, now I get it. On the the battery on his actual torch or his flashlight began to run out, but he also had a backup, so that was a good thing to have in case emergency, which he's in right now. But he only used this flashlight to find drinking water and to urinate. The rest of the time, he just spent there in total darkness by himself, thinking that he was going to die, thinking that his best friend was going to die, and this was just the scariest moment for Cisco. At first, he thought that Guillem would find his way out and the emergency crew would come in and save him, but after about five hours of just sitting in the dark, he started to get really fearful. This was true dread. This is a worst case scenario for a cave diver. He was fearing that he lost his friend and he was going to lose his own life. It was very clear to Cisco that things were getting bad. And he started to think about his family. He started to think about the fact that he could die a slow death with the carbon dioxide poisoning, all alone in a cave. It was very dark in there. He felt his pulse quicken. And this is one of the first signs of carbon dioxide poisoning. As soon as it was close to 8 p.m. on Saturday evening, less than an hour later, Guillem actually ended up bursting through the water surface and tore his regulator from his mouth and inhaled fresh air. His fingers were shaking when he got out of the water. He was so nervous and rattled from that traumatizing experience, but he knew what he needed to do, and that was called the rescuers. Within an hour, some of the island's top cave divers had assembled a team in the pitch dark above ground to come up with a game plan to save Cisco. One of them was Burmet Clemore, who had almost as much diving experience as Cisco. Burnett was very aware of this cave and he thought there's a lot of carbon dioxide in that cave. Cisco is going to have a really hard time surviving and we we have no idea how long he has before he dies. The group agreed that the two divers familiar with the cave would go in first. Guillem marked Cisco's location on a laminated map and handed it to the men before watching them head underground. Two hours later they returned with bad news. I'm pausing it for a second so I can understand this map. You can see the amount of air in this cave. Yeah, so I guess Cisco was like here in this hole, maybe? So this is water. water. I love it that the water, I was looking at the legend, it says, d like, the zone denied. That's what it says in Spanish. It's like, oh, don't okay. go there because there's water. Okay. <laughs> That's exactly where they went. Okay. In the rush to reach the surface, Guillem had stirred up the water to the point where the visibility was almost zero. It was impossible to reach the markers indicating which way they would go when the tunnel forked. So at this point, they were going to have to wait for the water to clear before diving again. It could take hours or even days for the settlement to settle. I mean, this this was definitely Cisco's death. He was going to die. It was almost a sure thing. Cisco might choke to death breathing the carbon dioxide, but Burnett knew that diving in water like chocolate was a death sentence for everyone. It doesn't make sense to have all the rescuers go into a situation where they're most likely going to die and would disagree someone. you got to wait out for the water to get a little bit less sediment based and clear out so you can actually see where you're going and i mean he would he would do a search yeah and he would use those instincts of his with a line <laughs> that he's really now to say yeah. i think that passage seems to be the way to go and he's Got yeah. that instinct. But imagine Ed showed experience. up and be like, oh, no, that's too murky. We got to wait. Oh, no, he doesn't know that. <laughs> yeah, he's going in. 
that. That's and for sure. He immediately. And the team didn't want to put anyone else's life at risk. So they decided to wait it out. There was nothing to do but wait at this point. As Cisco sat in the dark cave, minutes felt like hours, and he was dizzy due to the effects of the carbon dioxide in the air. So he was really starting to feel the effects. His diving watch actually stopped at this point and he had no idea what was going to happen. He, he, he lost complete track of time at this point, and a real creeping dread started to grab a hold of him, and he started to think that Guillermo was just dead, and he's not going to survive, and there's no way he's getting out of this. No one knows where he is. He's turning on his headlamp, kind of frantically looking around. Cisco made his way down the lake to the ledge in that chamber. Cisco started looking around the chamber, kind of freaking out, and he decided that he's going to start drinking some of the water. So he, he cupped his hands, pulled it up to his mouth, started to drink some of the water in the cave. But the water in the cave was very salty mm -hmm. overall. The top, top layer was actually clean and fresh. Although he could get some clean water, the air was still filled with carbon dioxide, so it was definitely not clean. Cisco made his way back to where he was resting on that flat surface in the cavern, and he started to have a lot of pain in his temple. The carbon dioxide is really starting to take effect of him. Every wow. single movement that he makes, every breath, Terrible. everything that he does, movement of his limb, whatever, takes a lot more energy, and he's just very lethargic and confused. Cisco started to lay down and tried to remain calm. This was very hard to do. He was just totally freaking out at this point. He just sat there in the dark. He wouldn't use his headlamp to look around or do anything. That's just extremely miserable and just horrifying. Completely disastrous situation at this point. Cisco started to wonder about his ex-wife and if she's been notified. He got divorced just about a year ago and the divorce had been devastating for Cisco. He loved his family. He loved playing with his kids. He loved doing things with them. He was a great father. Thinking about them growing up without a father going forward was just horrifying to him. And these thoughts were just impossible to get rid of in his head. He started worrying about never seeing his kids again. He didn't even know if his family was aware that he was trapped underground and about to die. He had no idea. Then he started to think about the divers on the island. What will they think of him when he died underground? At this point, Cisco was trapped 300 meters underground in this cave for six hours. It was just a horrible situation. Above ground, a team of medics stood by with Waiting. a psychologist on hand, and divers and cavers from around the island stood debating the best course of action. So the rescuers actually started to make an attempt. They went in there. They couldn't get deep enough in the cave to where Cisco was because the water was mud. It was impossible to get through, and it was very dangerous. There was also local members of the National Police that were setting up tents and barricades to keep the crowd that was forming at bay. There was a huge crowd forming outside the cave because they knew what was going on. It was drawing all this attention. The general director of emergencies for the islands was on the scene, and the rescue is now directed by a group of subaquatic activities on Melroca. After listening to various divers and law enforcement officials, this director decided that they were going to wait until morning before they dived again. And everyone there just broke out in a, a loud groan. There is wow, anger is at ridiculous. this statement because they didn't understand how dangerous the situation was for the rescue team. But this is the decision that was made and they just had to wait it out before they could go in and try to attempt to rescue Cisco. Everyone knew that Cisco was in great danger and he was very close to dying. Time was at the essence. He might be sucking down the last bit of toxic air that his body can handle in that little cavern. At this point it was 9.30 on Sunday night, so he went in on Saturday afternoon, and then now it's Sunday night at 9.30, wow. almost about 30 hours. Wow. And people started to think that by tomorrow when they enter this cave, Cisco's just going to be dead. Yeah. Suddenly Bring Cisco started to see a little bit of commotion, so Cisco actually did decide to turn his headlamp on at this point but it started flickering and then he realized that it was starting to lose its batteries and it had finally died and the darkness felt almost blinding to him he was all alone very deep in the cave he was kind of sure at this point that that's going to be the last place that he was going to be on earth and he was going to die here and that was going to be that he was convinced that this was going to happen yeah. not too long after that cisco started to hear some gurgling sounds coming from the water he began to think that someone might also be down there with him in the cave he hadn't really explored every single piece of the cavern so maybe there was someone else down there so he started listening and there was just silence and he's kind of looking around but it was pitch dark and then he decided to just lay down on those wet rocks take a shallow breath he needed to figure out what was going on sure that he was ready mentally and physically 
if someone was actually going to come and rescue him. So he started to get a little bit of hope, but not much. And he started to get a little bit realistic about, thought, hey, I need to be ready if someone's going to come in here and rescue me. He was also thinking that this is just a hallucination and that no one's going to rescue him and this is all just in his head. At this point, the carbon dioxide was starting to saturate his blood. It was very hard to keep conscious. And he started to think about his mother and his children, his sister-in-law, who was actually dying of cancer. So he was just thinking of all these extremely dark thoughts. As this happened, he also started to think about the pocket knife that was tucked into his bag. So this dive knife was, was used for cutting different things, but if he wanted a quick death, he could just kill himself and that would be a lot sad. less of a painful no, death than really dying sad. slow from the carbon dioxide. Yeah, the air in the cave funny, at this point is very toxic to and it has about 5% carbon dioxide. Normal air contains about 0.04% carbon dioxide, 0.03, somewhere around there with low levels of oxygen. Breathing in this cave air took a physical and mental toll on Cisco. He suffered constant severe headaches that rendered him unable to sleep. So he wasn't even able to sleep if he wanted to. And his mind was just constantly playing tricks on him. The hallucinations were coming Suffering. in and then they were causing him to see lights that were yeah. not there, hearing noises, thinking people were there. He was completely losing it. He started to hear bubbles, but then he would see no diver blowing them. So he was just completely hallucinating. And then after a couple more days, there was no sign of a rescue. Garcia was a couple more days psychological stress. At this point, he even grabbed his knife knife clutching it really close to his chest, thinking he would rather just kill himself rather than die a slow one from starvation and suffocation. If the gas doesn't kill him, he just he just wanted to die at this point. Above ground, finally, they decided to start the rescue operation again, and Freddy, who's a close friend of his, has been on? waiting, jumping at the bits to get in the cave. He couldn't before, and the team is getting ready to jump into the cave. So Freddy entered the cave, and as he began to swim down the first tunnel, the water was actually really clear in there. Not crystal clear, but good enough to to see how to get through and he was Florida able to case. work on Absolutely. cutting through the lines that were there and creating his new line he cut every single guideline in the cave that was leading up to cisco after two hours he emerged from the cave beaming so freddy almost made it to cisco almost reached the cavern but he needed to turn back at this point he told the team hey we can actually get in there we can get into the cavern and we can save cisco but let's do this so burnett actually decided to jump in with freddy at this point burnett was ready to go as well so he grabbed his tanks and within minutes he was deep in the water with a single guideline to follow he's able to make his way through the underground maze straight toward the chamber to where Cisco was very quickly they got up to Cisco the priority now is to establish whether Cisco was alive and what kind of rescue mission this was going to be were they going to rescue him alive or were they gonna be recovering his body Cisco started hearing something above him and this was actually a drill so the rescue team decided to start drilling above ground and then the, the rescue efforts stalled first sign that Cisco oh, had that Gia is. made it out alive was the sign of a drill above him. So he could tell that there was some sort of rescue effort going on, but he also wasn't sure if he was hallucinating. The rescue wow. team tried to drill a hole into the cave, but wow. this was unsuccessful. They were trying to drill that hole in to give Cisco air. some food yeah. and water and to kind of check and in air. on him but this didn't work. And after waiting another day for the silt to settle, all of a sudden a light began dancing on the roof of the cave. Freddie and Burnett were there. They were yelling Cisco and they popped up through the water, grabbed Cisco and gave him a huge hug. Cisco's first question was, is Guillen dead? And they told him that no, he made it out alive and he's gonna save your life potentially if we can get you out. So they gave Cisco some glucose gel for energy and this kind of snapped him back to reality a little bit. Now that he had some glucose in his system, they told him what the situation was and that they had to wait a while to have the, the water turbidity turned down a bit so it could be clear for them to perform the rescue. At this point, the two divers were going to go out of the cave to tell everyone that he's alive and then come what? back in and get Cisco with air. They decided that Freddie and Burnett were going to leave the cave, go get some more air, and then come back and get Cisco, bring him out of the cave as a rescue. So this whole process took about four hours. So they left so him in there divers, breathing Freddie more CO2? <laughs> I'm trying to understand. They I, said, all right, we'll be back. This is a disaster. Well, Bye bye. We're gonna leave with our air, yeah. and we, you just need to hang on with CO two for a little while. But I have I've had a headache for four days. Thanks, and for I'm the, throwing up blood. Thanks for the sugar. You, but can you're gonna go? I'll be looking at you like you're leaving again. No, that I have a knife. You're not leaving. <laughs> no way this you're is leaving. Insane. I cannot believe that they both decided to leave again. Oh no, we're just gonna wait for two days until the visibility is perfect before we go in. 
What? Left Cisco to go get wow. some more air wow. and then come back. They grabbed him, That's gave him crazy. some air, and then the three of them left the cave. Somehow they got out of the cave and Cisco was rescued. All of their headlights were beaming on the people and it was just crazy. The whole scene was just an explosion of happiness and joy. At this point, Cisco needed some nitrix air to get his oxygen levels back to normal. Cisco ended up breathing in pretty potent mixture of this nitrox air, which kind of brought him back to life and sure. started to give him some sense of himself. His head began to clear a bit, and he was able to take a deep breath for the first time in 58 hours, which is just wow. insane. Uh, he started to smile and was just so thankful for his Three two friends, days. Freddie and Burnett. He was so happy. This was such a horrifying experience for him. It took about 60 hours in total from when he first entered the cave. There was now, you know, we're sitting here being critical, but at the same time, I want to be complimentary. They rescued him. So maybe, Bro. you know, it's very easy to sit here in this chair in a comfortable environment and say well we wouldn't have we we why did you wait so long you could have gone in there with no well, visibility but and we're reacting to what he's but, talking about in the video which is not facts like it could the facts could have been different yeah but maybe maybe i'm just saying they and they did the right thing and the reason we know they did the right thing is because he's rescued and alive Okay. That's it. I mean, maybe they would have died any other way. So I kind of am withdrawing from being so critical. It seems crazy, I will admit, to leave somebody in there knowing there's filled with CO2 and wait another day and wait another day. But, you know, they had some it. experience, obviously. And Just cheers of joy rescuers, and, and he made it. happiness with everybody that was there. The site was just just such a, a beautiful thing to see Cisco walk out of that cave with his two friends. Yeah. Guillaume broke his way through the crowd with a huge grin and gave Cisco a big hug. He was so happy to see his friend alive. This was one of the most dramatic experiences for everyone involved. Cisco sure. survived a, a situation where he was almost certainly going to die. Today, the chamber where Cisco and Guillaume had sought refuge is known as the Room of the Three Miracles. This is the name that Cisco gave it. The first miracle was that Cisco found the chamber with the air. The second was that he survived breathing the air with so much carbon dioxide. And the third is that he was able to escape the terrifying ordeal with his life. Enrique Ballesteros, a member of the Civil Police Underwater Task Force, told Spanish newspaper El Mundo that the decision to send Guillaume alone to the surface is what ultimately saved Cisco's life. Wow. They could have tried to stretch out the remaining oxygen, but surely they would have, would have both died and this would have been suicide. The near-death experience has not shaken Cisco's love for diving as he vowed to continue mapping caves of Malroca. And just two weeks after that whole ordeal, Cisco returned to the same cavern <laughs> with which he was trapped wow. to do some mapping and to analyze the air. Well, wow. I guess we need to contact Mr. Cisco and come diving in Mallorca. Yes. So <laughs> try to have that done here by the For end sure. of the evening. And <laughs> let's get the tickets. Let's do it. Business class, if you could. That's, I don't know well, about that. I can't sit that long. <clears throat> well, I'll go and I'll let you know how it went. But um, you'll go and we, coach and let me know how it sure, went. Sure, no problem. And to come up and let me know how it's going back yeah, there okay. while I'm laying down. But wait, 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 wait. Before we talk about going to Mallorca, why don't we just talk to Cisco? The guy who was actually see, in the cave. See what he was this thinking about. Is amazing. I want everybody to know I watched his video twice. <laughs> it's so mind boggling. And yeah. I wanted to be sure when we get the chance to talk to Cisco that I kind of remembered everything that happened. Can you start off by just asking him a general question? Yes. What happened? Yeah. <laughs> and and just for those of you watching, I'm actually gonna try my best to translate Cisco is from Spain. He speaks Spanish. I'll be a translator, and we'll see how this goes. Okay. Cisco, bienvenido al show. Queremos saber qué pasó cuando... Eh, eh, estamos hablando de la historia esa donde al parecer encontraste como un, un hueco, no sé, con aire, y estuviste ahí por unos días y eso. Entonces queremos saber, porque la, la historia es un video que vimos en YouTube, pero no sabemos exactamente qué fue lo que pasó. Entonces vamos a empezar por ahí. Bueno, estaba... Esta es una cueva, la cueva de Sapiqueta, que está en Mallorca. Es una cueva que en el año, cuando pasó esto, en el 2017. ¿Quieres que vaya contestando poco a poco para traducir? Sí, o... sí, sí, yo, yo traduzco. So, so this happened at a, at a cave in 2017 in Mallorca, where we should go and dive. Ok. <laughs> Absolutely. Ok. Es un tipo, un tipo de cuevas muy parecidas a las que hay en Yucatán. 
Okay, this these caves are very very uh, close to what you see in Yucatan in Mexico. Okay, beautiful. Yo empecé a hacer espeluceo en el año 1994. You started cave diving in 1994. Wow. Okay. Y en Mallorca tenemos la facilidad de, como están muy cerca, Mallorca es pequeña, pues prácticamente cada semana hacemos espeluceo. So, Mallorca is a small island, so all the caves are pretty close to where he lives, so he can dive, cave dive every weekend. Hmm. Uh, nuestros in, nuestro, nuestros <laughs> inicios, <laughs> <laughs> nuestros inicios en espeluceo uh, tuvi, tuvieron mucho que ver con conexiones con los galeses, con el grupo de Martin Farr y Owen Clark. He said that uh, he was connected to Martin Farr's team um, from Wales. So Wales people, Welsh people came to Mallorca and started diving and he connected with them and that's how he got started. Okay. Que fueron los que nos enseñaron el sistema de buceo con botellas laterales para so, poder pasar por sitios estrechos. So he learned how to sight mount from Martin Farr. Okay. Yep. Entonces desde 1994 cuando empezamos uh, realmente no hemos parado de ir descubriendo nuevas cuevas y hemos explorado más de 50 kilómetros de galerías subacuáticas. Wow. So, since 1994, they have explored over 50 kilometers of underwater caves in wow. Mallorca. Wow. That's awesome. Wow. That's Esta over 30 miles, donde... by the way. That's a lot. La cueva donde pasó este incidente, eh, la cueva de Zapiqueta, es una cueva muy complicada, no por la profundidad, pero sí por otras cosas. Said that the cave where the incident happened in 2017 is a complex cave, not because of depth, but for a variety of reasons. Na navigation. ¿Qué, qué, ¿Qué es lo que lo hace complicado? What makes it complicated? Es muy laberíntica. It's like a labyrinth. Muy ramificada. Uh, hay una muchísimo sedimento. A lot of. Y silk. además mucho sedimento y muchas zonas estrechas. In very tight, tight spaces. A ton, a ton of zones that are tight. So losing the line in there would be a very dangerous situation. Sí, perder la línea sería muy peligroso en esa cueva entonces. Exacto. That's right. Entonces, lo que ocurrió fue una serie, la estábamos explorando, es una cueva ni siquiera, todavía está en fase de, explora, de, de exploración, de hecho. Nosotros trabajamos, normalmente tenemos siempre dos, tres, cuatro cuevas en marcha, que las vamos trabajando Uh, porque uh, para no quemarnos, diríamos, estar siempre en la misma, pues vas alternando, no muchas, porque entonces no hacen nada. Pero so, sí que tenemos siempre tres o cuatro. Más. So they, they are exploring three to four cave systems at the same time right now. That cave it, it, with the incident in 2017 is still being explored, but they take turns so they don't get like bored of the same system. Nuestras oh. exploraciones duran muchos años, como también en otras cuevas de características similares. Y entonces, esta cueva, en fase de exploración, eh, ya habíamos trabajado años antes, pero eh, la dábamos casi por acabada. Y entonces eh, aparecieron, forzando sitios muy estrechos, aparecieron continuaciones muy importantes. De hecho, habíamos encontrado con varios compañeros unos... Esta zona nueva de la cueva tenía unos nueve kilómetros de galerías subacuáticas nuevas. Wow, so they thought the cave where this happened was done, basically. Like, there's nothing else to go, but they kept pushing on the tighter spaces, like super, super tight, and they found nine kilometers of cave by fitting through these super tight spaces, which is where this incident happened. It was a new area of the cave. Okay, wow. Entonces, ocurrió lo que puede a veces ocurrir, que nunca te lo crees, que es una serie de coincidencias negativas que se sumaron entre ellas. So what happened to him is a cons it's, it's a result of multiple small things that happened at the same time in succession. So it wasn't like a big thing, it was a lot of little things that caused the problem. Interesting because that is actually taught in a lot of the cave classes about how these small compounding errors can really turn into a giant problem. What if there was a small problem what was the first one and why at that point wasn't the dive called? You know, what explain those small problems? So, él dice que en la, en la clase de buceo de cuevas siempre nos, nos enseñan que 
casi nunca las cosas que pasan es un problema grande, siempre es un problema pequeño, pero después cuando se suman todos esos problemas, entonces se crea un, programa, un, pro, un problema gigantesco. Entonces él está preguntando, ¿cuáles fueron esos pequeños problemas que empezaron a pasar y por qué no, di, digamos, abortaron eh, el buceo, sino que decidieron seguir? Bueno, realmente el problema apareció cuando ya habíamos acabado el trabajo. Ese día nosotros, est yo estaba explorando uh, unas galerías a uh, unos 30 metros de profundidad más o menos y un compañero mío uh, estaba haciendo topografía en otra zona cercana. So, this happened basically when, when they were done. He was just exploring like a new gallery, like around 99 feet, so 100 feet. Um, but his body, who's the topographer, the guy who, who draws the cave or whatever, he was somewhere else. Yo estaba regresando de mi trabajo. Bueno, yo había entrado con cuatro tanques. Había dejado uno a unos 200 metros de la entrada, otro uh, cerca del sitio que donde estaba trabajando y había continuado, como lógico, con otros dos tanques. So he took four tanks. One was 200 meters from the entrance, which was which is like 660 feet or something like that, 656. Um, and then another one in the gallery that he was exploring, and then he had two side mount tanks on top of that. Okay. Y cuando estaba regresando de la sala profunda, entonces um, había dejado el tercer tanque. En, una, en un sitio que no era el habitual, en una galería estrecha, que mi compañero, cuando acabó su trabajo, entró, era una cosa extraña porque no tenía que haber entrado en esta galería. Entonces, entró en la galería donde tenía mi tercer tanque y se ensució completamente, se puso a visibilidad cero. So, where they left the third tank was at a place that they don't use, they, they don't usually leave the tank in, and his body, their cartographer, went in to get the tank where he shouldn't have and he silted the place out because it was a tight tight place and it was zero visibility at that point was there a lines there so no, entonces ustedes no tenían línea cuando estaban entrando a buscar tanques y esas cosas sí, sí línea siempre está fija entonces yo lines, me puse always. el tercer tanque me lo me lo puse en el en el arnés y uh, estoy ya con visibilidad cero completamente y empezamos a regresar hacia uno de los cruces que tenía que señalar la salida. So he hooked the tank in zero visibility on his harness and started getting out to make it to a jump so they can get out of the cave. Pero entonces, eh, todo esto con visibilidad absolutamente cero, uh, pasamos de largo la zona donde tendría que haber habido el cruce de salida y nos adentramos a una zona que, que ya vimos que habíamos pasado de largo. Entonces, fuimos para adelante y para atrás varias veces intentando localizar el cruce de salida. So, when they were swimming out, trying to find this jump on the line, so it wasn't, it wasn't like at a dead end. It was like the line continued and then the jump was tied to that line to the other line. So they missed it and they just kept swimming in zero vis and they're like, okay, I guess we missed it. So they would come back, look for it, make it to the starting point. Okay, I missed it again. They will go back and they just kept missing the jump back and forward multiple times. Estamos a unos 900 metros de la entrada de la cueva. Wow. So they're 900 meters from the entrance. They're far, almost a kilometer into the cave. Wow. Yep. Um, Hicimos eh, una, una vuelta, bueno, intentamos localizar este cruce yendo adelante y atrás un par de veces con visibilidad cero sin encontrarlo. Y entonces um, sabíamos que cerca había una sala con aire y salimos a esta sala. So they tried to find the jump a couple times back and forth where they couldn't find it and they just knew that there was an air pocket and they said, okay, dude, let's just go to the air pocket. So they knew there was an air pocket on that line. I'm just, I'm, here's where I'm confused, Gus. Mm -hmm. When you say you couldn't find the jump, that would be jumping to another line to go further into the cave. Because if you made a jump, right, to yeah. go further into the cave, that line stays. The jump line stays. Right. So why were they having to jump to another line they couldn't to exit? Find, they couldn't why find could the they... line. The, they, they had the jump set and they couldn't find it. That's what he's saying. No, but. On I the mean, way out. 
So, no so they salto. lost the main line. They lost says, the main line. Yeah. Nosotros so, en, en Mallorca normalmente no solemos hacer saltos. Eran oh, líneas continuas. That's not make it. Go ahead okay. and explain. So that he said said they in Mallorca they don't jump. They don't jump lines. It's like the whole cave is already lined up. There's no jumping. Okay. And what he's saying is the line that connected to the main line was not there. Entonces, oh. la, entonces ustedes oh. no estaban haciendo esos saltos. Entonces, la, digamos, la línea que se conectaba con la línea de salida, esa que se había desaparecido, se soltó, se partió, ¿qué pasó? Bueno, lo que hicimos entonces fue, ahora te lo explico, lo que hicimos entonces fue, hablé, hablé con mi compañero, con Guillem, y dijimos, bueno, vamos a intentar, voy a intentar yo, porque dos no, no servía de nada, intentar encontrar esta ramificación de salida. Entonces me volví a meter hacia el interior y llegué a un sitio, todo esto sin visibilidad, que vi que la, la instalación en la roca, en una punta de roca, se había roto. Entonces la guía bailaba con un trozo de roca que, que oscilaba. Ok, so they made it out to the air pocket and they talked to each other. They said, what do we do? And, you know, Cisco said, well, there's no point for both of us to be in zero vis trying to find this thing. Let me go down and I'll try to find it. And what he ended up finding is that the line got to a rock and then it was broken. It was like just floating in the water. The line that attached the main line was broken. Okay. Pero yeah. El problema fue que yo entonces instalé una, un line reel, un carrete de, 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 para intentar encontrar. Yo interpreté que so se había roto up. en este uh -huh. sitio el, el cruce. Interpreté esto. Entonces me puse a buscar con visibilidad cero, totalmente con las manos, eh, con, el, con el carrete, a ver si encontraba el hilo suelto. So he, he tied up his own reel to the end of the line that he thought it was broken, it was floating in the, in the water, to try to find the other line. So it's like yes. line loss, basically, okay. a lost line drill, yeah. Exacto, la línea perdida. Mm -hmm. Pero entonces, el problema que fue, que este sitio estaba cerca, pero no era el lugar donde, sabía, donde estaba la ramificación. Entonces estuve perdiendo mucho tiempo en un sitio que con esta rotura daba la sensación que era aquí. Si hubiese habido visibilidad no hubiera habido ningún problema, pero es que no sabía absolutamente nada. Interpreté yo que era este el sitio de la armificación que se había roto y no era este. O sea que ahí, ahí es donde estaba, era el final de la línea, no era que se había roto. sino no, que era por ahí. en medio, era una instalación que se había roto la roca. Pero era por el medio, ni siquiera era, no había ningún final. Wow. No, esto es un sitio entre medio. Ok, so, so where, where he thought the line was broken, it was broken, but it wasn't the place where he thought it was. He just had zero vis. He's like, if I have visibility, I would tell that, okay, this is broken. The line is broken, but this doesn't go to the main line. It just broke somewhere else. And he just lost too much time trying to find the main line, but he wasn't near it. He, he just wasn't even close to it. Okay. And he's all by touch. Entonces, ¿qué pasó? Que, primero, problemas. La tercera botella, el tercer tanque, que normalmente lo dejábamos en un sitio, lo dejaba yo en un sitio que lo tenía muy controlado, lo puse en un sitio que normalmente no lo, no lo solía dejar. Uh -huh. Entonces, mi interpretación mental fue que, la, además de la rotura en esta instalación, que estaba buscando más en el interior de lo que era eh, realmente la, el cruce de salida. Que cruce de salida no se había encontrado. También debía haber una, un problema, debía estar muy suelta la guía porque no, no se encontró el, la salida. Pero haciendo esta búsqueda de la. buscando la guía ciegas, se perdió ya muchísimo aire. Entonces yo ya había vuelto, con, había consumido el tercio, entonces consumí muchísimo en estos viajes, más de lo que tocaba. Entonces volví otra vez a la sala con aire y hablé con mi compañero. So he just wasted too much time. But remember, by the time that they lost visibility, he had already gone through his first third of air. And now looking for this line, he completely went over the second third. Like he was just very, very low. So he went back to the air pocket to talk to his buddy. Entonces nos dimos, bueno, primer problema. Bueno, primero no, ya era el segundo. Esta sala con aire tenía un nivel de CO2 muy alto, casi no podía respirar, más de un 5%. No lo sabíamos. Los compañeros que la habían encontrado nos hablaban de que, que cuando te quitabas el regulador de la boca casi te quita, te podía respirar poco porque estaba muy cargada. So the air pocket that they found had over 5% CO2. He couldn't even breathe. Like they, oh, that's high. They would take the regulator off their mouth and yes. like be struggling to breathe. Yeah, because in regular... 
Regular air, I have to go back and look, but it's a tiny fraction. Oh, Nowhere near 5%. Yeah. Like that, yeah. Why, why does he think the main line broke? Now I'm curious, to, did they kick it? Was it already in bad shape? Le está preguntando la línea que estaba rota. ¿Qué, qué pasó con esa línea? ¿La rompió alguien? ¿Alguien la pateó? ¿Qué fue lo que pasó? No se sabe, no, no, ni siquiera ahora, después de cinco años, lo sabemos exactamente. Like five years los, later, compañeros que, okay. los que compañeros que volvieron con, a, a posteriori filmaron esa zona y vieron, filmaron esta punta de roca que estaba rota, que era lo que nosotros mal interpretamos, pero donde estaba la ramificación de salida, él, se ve que el hilo también se había roto alguna instalación y debía estar caído. Y quizás cuando pasábamos no, lo, no tocábamos la flecha de, sa de salida. Ok. So, okay, okay, yeah, so they went it's back and recorded and they, they can see that it's broken and they still have no idea how or why, even today. Estamos acostumbrados porque las cuevas aquí tienen normalmente muchísimo sedimento. Es decir, no, no es que sea una situación rara de estrés, es algo que estamos acostumbrados. Pero en esta ocasión, uh, todos estos factores y sobre todo aquella rotura en un sitio que no era el, donde era realmente, hizo perder muchísimo tiempo. Y bueno, entonces uh, or, um, organizamos cómo lo podemos hacer en esa sala con aire. So, so he's saying that the caves in Mallorca are very silty. So he wasn't even panicking. He's just like he couldn't find the the place where he can set the jump to the other line. So he he just went through a lot of air, not even panicking. Just he couldn't find a way to make a jump. Yeah, you may want to tell him like in Florida now. Now we, you and I can really appreciate these line committees. Yeah. And for our viewers, this is why we have line committees that literally go in and inspect the lines regularly. And they may mm -hmm. not have that there. Obviously, they don't. Lo que But está just let them know que, we have that. Sí, que aquí en Florida nosotros tenemos un comité de línea que in inspeccionan y arreglan la línea y la mantienen siempre en buen estado. Pero, o sea, no nadie se mete a un buceo y va a encontrar la línea rota o, o algo así, sino que la, los comités de línea la mantienen. Pensar que nosotros estábamos en fase de exploración de esta mm -hmm. cueva. Solamente conocíamos esta cueva cuatro personas. So it's like there's only four people that have dived in this cave, so it was still exploration. There's yeah. no line committees here. Yes. No hacemos mantenimiento de líneas si está la cueva en exploración. Yeah. Ni siquiera está acabada. Todavía. Well, cave, But, this brings up the point of cave exploration, everybody. It's another level. level, man. Another level. Es, por eso decimos que los lo que exploran las cuevas como tú están en un nivel mucho más alto que el de nosotros. No, yo no digo por esto. Yo lo digo porque uh, ahora, ahora que hay más gente en Mallorca que hace espelugueo, hay algunos que empiezan a hacer, digamos, reinstalar algunas cuevas. Mm. So some people are coming on explore caves and they're trying to reinstall lines and you know fixing lines, but uh, what they were doing is exploring. Entonces ustedes salen en el en el en el hueco de aire, casi no pueden respirar y la decisión es que ahora tu compañero vaya a intentar a salir. Bueno, entonces uh, nos planteamos qué podemos hacer. Yo provengo del mundo del espelo, de la espeleología, en cambio mi compañero provenía del mundo bien del buceo. Yo estoy más acostumbrado y además lo sé porque cada persona, cada cuerpo es diferente, la resistencia a sitios con muchos dedos. Yo estoy acostumbrado, no es que me guste en absoluto, pero comparado con otros veo que hay gente que casi se desmaya y yo en, en algunas circunstancias de estas pues aguanto más. So he, his background is from caving, like dry caving, mm. whereas his body comes from diving. Mm. Um, so he says that he doesn't enjoy the high CO2 levels, but he mm. is more used to it mm. because of caving. So they decided that, look, I'll stay behind. It's going to suck, but, you know, it would be worse for you to stay behind because you're not used to it. Mm -hmm. Entonces, uh, también Guillem, mi compañero, eh, tiene una complexión más delgada, consume mucho menos aire que yo. Plus, my body is smaller, thinner, he has a be better sac rate than me. Okay. Entonces miramos so when... sus tanques. Mm -hmm. Sí. Well, when the buddy left, he obviously lined himself out. So there was a line now all the way back to the exit because we know he made it. That, that, that much we all know mm -hmm. in the video. Just ask him, am I right? Factually, he put a line in, left the cavern, and took a line all the way out. Because you know where I'm headed. Where I'm headed is then why did the rescuers not immediately go back in knowing there was a line going now all the way back to the 
cavern or the, 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 the opening that he found. Entonces, Guillén, cuando, él, cuando ustedes chequearon los tanques y deciden que él debería uh, intentar salir, él, ustedes no pusieron una línea, digamos, desde el, desde el agujero de aire, que es más CO2 que aire a esta... A esta... Las guías, esas líneas estaban puestas. Ok. Entonces, nosotros sabíamos que porque estábamos topografiando con otros dos compañeros que ese día no estaban, nosotros sabíamos que había otras guías, otro circuito, que haciendo un rodeo de 300 metros más podías uh, evitar el sitio del problema, el cruce, okay. con visibilidad buena. El problema es que había un salto de unos 30 metros aproximadamente que no había guía. Entonces, uh, mi temor era que Guillem se perdiese a la hora de coger ese salto y se metiese en otras ramificaciones que no llevaban a, a la salida. So, there was a way to avoid the zero vis can't find the jump problem by going, it's like, a, it's a circuit. So, it's like, if you go the opposite way of the circuit, you have to go 300 more meters. So, it's still like 900 feet of swimming. So, it's a, it's a big chunk uh, or a thousand feet. But, but when you get to the end, you have to make a jump to the other line to get out. And there's other lines too. And he was afraid that Guillen wasn't going to make the jump to the right line. That was the fear. So he was going to make a jump, but connect to not the main line to get out, but a different line. But I get it. But he did make it out. Yes. So the rescuers could have followed that same path. And also these caves must not have high flow. We just confirmed that because uh -huh. the silt obviously lasted. Entonces, el, no, había, no había flujo de agua, ¿no? El, el, el sedimento se quedaba en el agua, no, no se disipaba. Nuestras cuevas aquí prácticamente no hay casi flujo, no, no, no hay no corriente. Fue. Tarda a veces una semana, dos semanas en depositarse el sedimento. Ok, entonces Guillén sale y tú tenías el miedo de que no iba a poder conseguir el, el, el salto, digamos así, para llegar a la línea que era en vez de agarrar otra línea y equivocarse peor. Eh, pero eventualmente sabemos porque ya vimos el video que él salió ya sale, sí. o sea que ya deben tener una línea hasta donde tú estás ¿no? porque cuando él hace el salto ese de 30 metros no lo hizo con una línea de él uh, bueno, el, pro el problema que hizo no, el problema que, que hizo Guillem es que uh, a ver, él tenía que hacer una vuelta en lugar de 900 metros hacer unos 1200 si conseguía llegar hasta este sitio una vez que conseguía localizar la, la guía correcta, entonces ya no había problemas porque nuestras cuevas, como todas están señaladas, todas con flechas indicando la salida. Claro. Pero lo que pasa es que yo cuando se fue Guillem le dije, Guillem, no tarden mucho. Esto era el sábado. Nosotros entramos el sábado por la mañana y esto debía ser cosa de las 5 de la tarde, más o menos, del propio sábado. Entonces yo le dije, Guillem, no tarden mucho en traer más botellas porque no sé lo tiempo, el tiempo que voy a aguantar yo respirando este aire. So, so he said it wasn't so much the concern that they had a line back or whatever, but it is it was Saturday night already. They went in in Saturday morning and it was 5 p.m. when the guy headed out and said, I don't know how long I can stay here with this CO2. So please don't take too long on bringing bottles back. Like I, I'm going to need some fresh air. So. Ya, yeah, so so, so, la, la pregunta que nosotros tenemos es, cuando él hace los 1200, tú dijiste que había uh -huh. un salto de 30 metros para llegarle a la línea que, sí. de salida. Sí, más o menos. Entonces, ese salto de 30 metros no lo hizo con una línea, no conectó las dos líneas. O fue un Pero salto visual. Un... Debió... Era un salto visual. Mm. So the jump, the 30 meter jump that they make from the end of the circuit to the line is a visual jump. It wasn't with a line. So they didn't have a line all the way back. Oh, yeah. That explains a lot. That's a different story. Yeah. That right there is what I've been confused the whole time. Now that would possibly prevent some rescuers yeah. from not wanting to go in because they basically have to go blindly Trying doing to a find blind a bl tying off a lost line. Jump. Tying off a line. Where's the jump? Where's the jump? Yeah. I thought the guy that left lined himself back all the way. So he got yeah, really lucky that. to find his way out. Yeah. Tuvo bastante suerte entonces de hacer el, el salto visual ese. Sí, lo que, claro, yo cuando empezó a pasar el tiempo, al principio creía que en unas, yo qué sé, cinco, seis, ocho horas, 
traería compañeros con más botellas porque era simplemente una cuestión ya de poder salir por falta de aire por el otro sitio. Sí. Pero, claro, cuando vi que la cosa empezaba a tardar y tardar y tardar, ya pensé lo peor. So he was expecting six hours after he left or something for a bunch of divers to come in with bottles and stuff and like, you know, get him out. But time keeps going on and on and on and he's just getting worried. Like, what happened? Because you have no idea. You know? Scary. Entonces, ¿cuánto tiempo pasó más o menos cuando ya dijiste, cuando ya esperaste lo peor, pues? Él quizás no pudo salir, se perdió, lo que sea. Bueno, es que otra coincidencia negativa fue que el ordenador de buceo, cosa que no suele pasar nunca, o sea, a mí se acabaron las, las baterías. Oh. Entonces, so, wow. yo no, era, no tenía reloj, porque normalmente no suelo usarlo, porque es el aire que me manda. No teníamos que salir a ninguna sala con aire. El buceo aproximadamente serían dos horas y media, tres. Y miramos los manómetros, ni siquiera los tiempos de descompresión o los del ordenador. Hay poca profundidad, normalmente no hace falta entrar en descompresión porque la mayoría de la cueva no tiene excesiva profundidad. So the only thing that could tell time was his dive computer and he died. The battery died, so he had no way of telling time. Oh, man. Entonces, yo no sabía el tiempo que había pasado. Y no con un aire tan... So, is he just laying there all day, all night, laying down, just sitting there? What do you do ¿Qué, está, ¿Qué estabas haciendo? O sea, estaba que acostado, pensando que... No, no podía moverme mucho porque con ese aire, a partir del 5% de CO2, el cuerpo responde muy mal. Entonces, me, cualquier... Estar parado ya era un esfuerzo muy grande. Entonces, procuraba moverme lo menos posible. ¿Pero en qué, en qué posición estaba? ¿Estabas parado, acostado, sentado? ¿Qué? Eh, eh, tuve que escalar entre bloques para ir a un sitio más cómodo. Uh -huh. Estas salas son salas de hundimiento, entonces son bloques inest bueno, inestables. Bloques que, que hacen que no, normalmente no estés cómodo cerca del agua, entonces tuve que subir a un sitio que busqué más plano para estar más cómodo. Entonces estaba sentado, a veces tumbado. Y, te, y cuando tenía sed, bajaba con la máscara a buscar agua. Para no tener que hacer tanto el viaje, bebía, la llenaba y me ponía en mi, en mi sitio. Ok, so he basically found a way to climb a little bit and found, found a place where he could sit or lay down. But he was trying not to move because CO2 was making him feel terrible. So he would just go down and grab water to drink and like fill his mask and like take the mask up to where he was sitting and just sit there with a mask and like just wait. I just hope. That's right. Yeah. Okay. La linterna las tenía que al principio tenía siempre una encendida porque claro, el foco de exploración solo se puede encender bajo el agua, ya estaba bastante gastado el primario y tenía tres linternas más, una que la había empleado también para topografía, para ver de cerca. Entonces tenía dos linternas uh, y media. Una cuando pasaron las horas siempre la tenía encendida cuando vi que tardaba ya tanto Decidí estar a oscuras y solamente encenderla para ir a orinar o para ir a buscar agua. Y el resto del tiempo estaba oscura. So he had four lights, like us. Um, but his main cave light, he had, he, the, the dive was three hours. So he was very, very low. Um, and then the other three, at first he was using them a lot. But at the end, he just, he was just in the dark and just turned them on when he had to pee or drink water. What, was he cold uh, and was he diving dry? What's the water temp in there? ¿Qué, ¿qué tenías puesto? ¿Tenías puesto un traje seco? ¿Estaba frío? ¿Cómo, cómo estaba la temperatura? No, aquí en Mallorca la temperatura de las cuevas suele estar sobre los 18 grados. Oh, okay. Entonces no usamos traje seco, usamos traje húmedo, a veces microporoso. Yeah, it's, it, he was in a wetsuit, but the water is, isn't cold in Mallorca. Well, what temperature? He said that? 18 Celsius. I don't know exactly how much that is in Fahrenheit. I'll put it on the screen. Anyway, okay, interesting. Yeah. Okay. Entonces, ¿qué, qué, qué empezó a, a pasar por, por tu cabeza? Porque por lo que estamos viendo en el video, tuviste unos pensamientos de que, bueno, no, quizás no me van a venir a buscar, ¿qué es lo que hago? Bueno, claro, yo estuve, eso fue, el, nosotros entramos en la cueva el sábado por la mañana, entre bajar las cosas por un 30 metros del nivel hasta el agua, después empezar a bucear, todo el problema este, y claro, el rescate fue... Casi, casi el martes de, maña de madrugada. Fue el lunes uh, prácticamente rozando el martes de madrugada. Entonces estuve tres días dentro de la cueva. Claro, respirando el aire de esta sala que ya me empezaba a afectar uh, la forma de pensar. Es decir, no era una desesperación psicológica porque estoy acostumbrado. Y por comida empezaba a tener un poco de acidez de estómago. Tampoco tenía frío, 
aunque salí con 32 grados de temperatura corporal, pero no tenía sensación de frío. Wow. So he's he's saying that he started having heartburn and the CO2 in the air really started affecting like his thought process. Um, and that even though he was very cold when he came out, like when they measure his body temperature, uh, he wasn't feeling cold while he was there. But he was there. They got, He went in on Saturday morning and he got rescue on Tuesday, like in the wee hours of the morning, like 3 a.m. or whatever. Okay, that makes sense, though, that he was cold, though his body temp was dropping. That's yeah. why I was asking that earlier. But he's Especially like, I didn't feel cold. Especially if you're sitting That's there weird. in a wetsuit, man. That really can make you cold. But that makes sense. Um, ¿Y, ¿Y qué estabas pensando? ¿Que tenía alucinaciones o algo así? ¿Algo raro? Sí, al final, claro, pensad que a estar a oscuras completamente, uh, la mayoría de tiempo, respirando súper mal. Hizo una pequeña exploración de la sala donde estaba, a ver si encontraba alguna salida. Pero claro, quedé súper agotado, porque es peor que subir al Everest sin, sin oxígeno. Sí. Y vi que no había ninguna posibilidad de salir por mis... Que no digo, a ver si hay una entrada escondida que pueda salir al exterior, pero no, no había esto. Entonces, claro, psicológicamente, pues poco a poco te vas hundiendo. Uh, hubo una, un... Yo no, no supe interpretar cuándo era, pero sí que empecé a escuchar oídos, ruidos, que es que estaban intentando, empezaron a hacer una perforación del exterior. Oh, okay. Did he say I have Doritos? No, oh. he didn't say Doritos. I, for a second, I, he said, <laughs> I, I, I have to, I, you know, I have something coming up, but go ahead. Yes. More. He said that he started exploring the hole to see if he can find an exit uh, because he was a big, big air, air pocket. Um, but he was so exhausted at the end of like climbing and trying to find holes and wedge himself or whatever that. You know, he, he was just, it's like he was climbing Everest without oxygen. Like, I was oh. so exhausted. Oh. Uh, and then at some point, I started hearing sounds. And I thought I was going crazy, but it was that they started drilling on the outside. Oh, that's right. Yeah. I remember that. Um, Pero en el video también dice que, que tuviste como pensamientos de, ¿será que mejor me clavo un cuchillo en el corazón y acabar con esto o okay? qué? Bueno, a ver... Uh... Cuando ya ve, se me estaba acabando la luz por completo, ya veía que me quedaba poco tiempo, entonces pensé, digo, a ver, aquí puedo tener la peor muerte que, te, que piensa un espeluceador, que es morirse de, de sed, o de, bueno, de sed no, de frío o de hambre durante semanas esperando. Entonces dije, antes de que no me quede a oscuras completamente, pues mira, uh, ya pensaba, digo, voy a buscar un cuchillo y una, un trozo de hilo por si acaso tener otra posibilidad de acabar más rápido. Wow. So I, I just asked him, it's like, at what point do you start to think maybe I should just stab myself in the heart? And you should not give up. That's and he said, he said that when his last flashlight was running low, he started thinking, it's like, you know, once I run out of battery and I have no more lights, I'm going to have the worst ever death thought for a caver, which is alone in a dark hole with no food. I'm going to die of starvation or I'm going to die of hypothermia over weeks. Like this will be a multi-week process and I'm just going to die. Because remember, he was thinking that his body drowned. Like he never made it out. Then nobody knows where they are. Um, so he procured a knife and a rope just thinking of his options. Y, ajá, pero a, a qué punto entonces tú dijiste, bueno, ya eso, o sea, no voy a pensar más acerca de, del cuchillo y eso. Fue cuando empezaste a escuchar los ruidos. ¿Qué, qué fue lo que pasó? Bueno, el ruido fue, yo al principio lo interpretaba como que eran compresores, porque el grosor de roca, encima mío, hasta la superficie, debe ser unos 30 metros de roca, aproximadamente. I asked him, when did you, you stop, when did you stop think, having these suicidal yes, thoughts? I was going to ask that. Uh, was it when you started hearing the noise? And he said, well, when I heard the noise, I thought it was air compressors, because mm -hmm. I'm like, there's no way they can be drilling down, it's 100 feet of rock above me. Like, yeah. Well, yeah. just because of the time. Yeah. I mean, so we're gonna, basically, we're gonna, we're gonna you know, get to the point where they came up, they had it, tanks for them. Mm -hmm. What did that feel like? Also, I tell them that I wanted to compliment. Wow, you know how to speak Spanish really well. I didn't. That's pretty cool. And then there's something behind his left left side of his head. Mm hmm. Does he also realize okay. that those are aliens? Waste time on, the okay. octopus Let's not waste aliens. time on that. But um, these octopus. It, él dice, él dice, estuvo o sea, queremos llegar a la parte donde por fin apareció alguien, viste unas caras, 
alguien salió, ¿verdad? Algún bus, algunos buses te consiguieron. ¿Qué fue lo que pasó en ese momento? ¿Te trajeron sí. tanques, se devolvieron? Porque en el video dice como que te consiguieron y después se fueron otra vez y te dejaron solo. Otra vez. No, no me consiguieron. El primero que consiguió... A ver, los, los buceadores empleaban... Uh, porque el problema era llegar hasta la sala donde estaba yo, con, con cuevas tan ramificadas, sin saber, porque salir es fácil siguiendo las flechas. Claro. Pero para entrar justo donde estábamos nosotros, el camino uh, no estaba tan claro. So finding the exit Entonces, is easy because you have arrows to the exit, but there's no arrow to the air pocket. So this is a maze, like a spaghetti ball, and it was hard to find them. Entonces fueron los, los compañeros que llegaron hasta mí tuvieron que ir cortando ramificaciones que eran las correctas para evitar perderse otros también. Entonces cortaron la línea por completo. No, cortaron las ramificaciones que no llegaban hasta mi sala. Ok, pero ¿cómo las cortaron? No entiendo. Es decir, cada vez que hay un, una ramificación, sí. pues cort, cortan el hilo y lo ponen a un lado haciendo salto, digamos. Okay. Para que solamente tuviese un, un hilo principal hasta mí, continuo. So they would start going in this like ramifications of the cave. And when they went in and couldn't find it, they would cut the line and like tie somebody somewhere else. So it, it wasn't like a continuous line. They would just cut, 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 and only have like one line as they continue to explore and try to find them. Well, tell them that really is, I understand now why they call it the three miracles, but the biggest one is that he found that air pocket. Mm -hmm. Because think about it, it's, what's the chances of finding an air pocket if it's just a maze? See, sí. you found the one spot that happened to get you in an air pocket with no visibility is Dice, unbelievable. Qué casualidad, que fue como un milagro que ustedes se perdieron o donde, digamos, se perdieron en la línea que no consiguieron la salida. Había un, un hueco donde había al, por lo menos aire que se podía respirar, a pesar de que era aire malo. Sí, fue un milagro. Fue un milagro. De hecho, pues esta sala la, baut la bauticé como la sala de los tres milagros. Entonces, ¿cuáles fueron los tres milagros? Which ones are the three miracles? Bueno, bueno uno de ellos fue que hubiese esta sala cerca. Yeah. Este fue el primero. So being, being near, having the air pocket near to where yes. we got lost. Yeah. Okay, that was the first. Ese fue el primer milagro. Sí, el segundo es poder haber respirado tanto tiempo durante, con este CO2 tan malo. The second miracle is being able to breathe for days under With such CO2. bad conditions. Yep. Yep. And third is that his buddy made it out and found him. Y el tercero. Bueno, el tercero que pudiesen rescatarme porque <laughs> estuvieron a punto de parar la operación eh, para evitar más muertes. Then the third one is that they almost called the rescue off so nobody else would die. And they didn't and they found him. Entonces al final te, te encontraron y qué pasó cuando llegaron a, a, a la sala donde estabas tú? Bueno, cuando salió, yo estaba arriba en la zona más cómoda y cuando salió Bernat, el primer compañero que llegó hasta mí, él no sabía si me había muerto, porque ellos el miedo que tenían, mientras tanto, era ver si yo hubiera sido capaz de aguantar todo el tiempo respirando ese aire. No lo tenían muy claro. Entonces, cuando él llegó a verme y salió y estuvimos hablando y después preparó el, el rescate, cuando volvió y dio la, el aviso de que estaba vivo, pues casi se celebró más que no cuando salí. <laughs> <laughs> so, they totally expected him to be dead by the time they found him, because yeah. it's like nobody's going to survive for this many days really breathing that crappy air so when he came out and said we found him alive to actually go and rescue him everybody celebrated way bigger than we when he actually got out so he's like <laughs> he got out and he's like oh yeah yeah we knew <laughs> <laughs> so they they wouldn't well yeah, well tell him i i, yeah, I have to you can continue i have to go i just yeah. happen to have to jump on another call thank you se, se está honest, despidiendo porque tiene una llamada, pero yo me voy a quedar y, y te hago unas preguntas más. And right, then, and then wrap up by saying, what did they learn? What are they doing different now? I always want to leave with a learning message. Okay. So what are they doing different it. now because of this? Thank you. Thank you. Gracias. Hasta luego. Bye. <laughs> Entonces, Cisco, eh, ¿por qué no te sacaron, digamos, la, al principio? Porque cuando te encontraron? la cueva... La cueva tiene tantas zonas estrechas y es tan complicada que el que está haciendo esos trabajos para intentar conectar no puede ya. Tiene que llevar los mismos tanques posibles. No podía wow. él intentar ir localizándome y encima llevar dos tanques extras para mí. Hasta cuando una vez que ya dejó el camino libre y solamente había este camino, esta autopista, entonces, aunque no se viese prácticamente nada, ya estaba el camino trazado, entonces ya podía no venir a después. Exacto. Entonces, después pues, me, me evaluó, estuvimos juntos media horita, un poco menos. Él miró a ver cómo me veía a mí, por si yo era capaz de volver. Porque la única forma de salir de esta cueva 
era por mis propios medios. Uh -huh. Entonces, a ver si yo sería capaz, estaba en condiciones de poder bucear el camino de regreso. Ok, déjame, déjame traducir para los, los que están viendo. Um, so, he's saying that, uh, my question was, why didn't he just come out when they found him for the first time, since, you know, they found him, why go out, say he's alive, let me bring more tanks and get him out, and the reason is because they were trying to find this air pocket, they were bringing only enough tanks for them to be able to find the pocket, but not extra tanks just in case they found him. And plus they thought he was going to be dead anyway. Um, so once they found him, you know, let me bring you tanks to see if you can swim out by yourself. Entonces después que te encontraron y sabían que estaban vivos, te preguntaron si podía salir y me imagino que dijiste que sí. Entonces la, bueno, la misión... Dos formas, per perdona que te interrumpa, sí. la primera... La pregunta que yo le hice a él al principio, primero que vi a era de la semana, pero a que Guillem, que el otro compañero, no había conseguido, uh, no lo había conseguido, porque yo creía que había muerto, uh, por tanto tiempo que tardaron, yo pensé que es que había muerto, porque el primer intento que hubo de autorrescate salió mal. Mm. Los compañeros hicieron el propio sábado por la noche un intento de autorrescate, que lo normal, pero las condiciones tan difíciles de la cueva hizo que tuvieron que abortar antes de llegar hasta mí. So the first question he asked the rescuers was, is Guillem alive? Did you find him? Is he dead? Uh, followed by learning that not only he made it out, but that same night, Saturday night, they tried to find him. They tried to rescue him and they couldn't do it. Entonces esa misma noche lo intentaron, no pudieron. Y después, ¿por qué esperar tanto hasta el, hasta el lunes, digamos así? Porque no se veía nada. Mm -hmm. el, el agua tenía las condiciones de visibilidad fatales. Entonces... Uh, los que mandaban el operativo rescate decidieron intentar a, uh, a partir de la topografía que se estaba haciendo. Los compañeros decían que no era fiable una cueva ya tan grande intentar localizar una sala que ni siquiera estaba acabada de topografiar, uh, que el horror era muy grande y era casi imposible que adivinasen la, con, la, la, con, el, con la exactitud, la, el, diríamos, la, pre, la precisión de una topografía subacuática. No puedes pretender que coincidiera exactamente el sitio de arriba con el de abajo. Mm. Es muy difícil. Entonces yo empecé a oír perforaciones. Al principio creía que eran compresores para rellenar, para llenar tanques. Y después vi que cada vez era más fuerte. Ya me imaginé que debía ser que estaban agujereando. So the challenge is the question was why didn't they just keep going Saturday, Sunday, etc. Instead of waiting till Monday to go in. And the answer was that the visibility was basically zero. And because it's like a spaghetti ball down there, trying to do this thing without seeing where you're going is impossible. Um, you know, they, they just needed to wait for the visibility to improve. And they, at the same time, kept drilling because he can hear the drills get closer and closer. Or at least the noise gets closer and closer. Entonces, eh, ellos te consiguen, ya tienes la autopista esa, ya saben dónde estás. Ellos van y buscan tanques, te los traen y te sacan y ya, se acabó la, la historia. Entonces, claro, Bernardo, Bernard regresa a la base y avisa de que estoy vivo, entonces preparan Dos compañeros más uh, entran con un GEAS de la, de la policía, con otro compañero espelbuceador, pues cada uno de ellos entran con un tanque extra para mí. De los dos, con, con dos me bastaba para salir. Claro. Y entonces uh, vuelve más o menos, esto que debía ser, sí, el, el lunes por la noche, sobre la, de las 10 de la noche, algo así, entre las 10 y las 11, no, el día debían ser, pues llegaron hasta mí con los tanques, les costó mucho llegar por la mala visibilidad. Y bueno, entonces ya preparamos la, el regreso. Wow. So Monday around 10 or 11 p.m., they strap, uh, two new divers strap a tank extra on top of the ones they needed themselves to try to find him. And again, visibility was still zero, but at least they had already found the air pocket. And, um, you know, that's when they got to him with the extra tanks to get out. Entonces, eh, pues en ese momento sales y ya las líneas estaban hechas uh, para salir. Y cuando saliste estaba a cero visibilidad, no se veía nada. Muy poco, sí. La mayoría del camino era con visibilidad cero. De hecho, cuando yo no suelo bucear sin guantes, porque en las, con la temperatura que hay normalmente me molesta para sen sentir el hilo guía uh -huh. y... Y demás, y me acuerdo que tenía las manos tantos días de estar con humedad elevada, pues se ve que tenía la piel muy frágil y te, tenía las manos todas llenas de heridas, de roce con las rocas, porque claro, tenías que ponerte la mano por delante claro. para evitar chocar en muchos sitios. Y eso claro. que en Mallorca empleamos siempre casco, eh, no es como en, otros, en otras cuevas de otros sitios del mundo, aquí siempre 
todos los prebusadores siempre emplean casco. Wow. So coming out, obviously, um, you know, he's struggling because there's zero visibility and his hands have been humid or wet for days, which made him be raw. And every time he bumped into a rock or whatever, um, you know, he would he would get hurt. And so they were all, all hurt. And so what happens is when you're when you're coming out on a zero visibility situation, you're always putting your OK in the line. So you, you put a circle on the line and then your other hand goes in front of your head because you're trying to protect your head as you swim forward. So that's why you have a hand in front of you when you're doing that. Más o menos tardamos cerca de una hora y media en regresar buceando. So it was an hour and a half. Normal sería an hour and a half. Sería una hora, pero en esas condiciones media horita más. Right. So on the normal conditions with regular visibility is an hour dive out, but it was an hour and a half because of the zero vis. Entonces, Cisco, después que, que sales uh, de ahí y, y, digamos, te recuperas y eso, eh, ¿en cuánto tiempo volviste a estar, a estar buceando? So, after you got recovered, you, or you got out of there and recovered, you know, from your, you know, your, um, whatever you had. A ver, your... yo, de... yeah. yo siempre de, desde pequeño con ocho años ya entraba en cuevas. Entonces, después uh, del 94 haciendo espero buceo, y yendo cada semana prácticamente en cuevas. Entonces, claro, cuando yo estaba ya que creía que no saldría vivo, pues llega un momento que dices, ojalá no hubieras hecho esto y todavía podría vivir más años. Pero el momento que ya me encontraron, ya entonces ya pensé que no lo dejaba. <risa> <risa> aún estaba en la, aún estaba en la cueva y ya pensé que no sería la última vez. So when he was basically in there without any track of time and no lights, And all the things to think about, the first thing he was thinking about is, I wish I had never gotten into cave diving or caving to begin with. Um, he was regretting that decision, but obviously as soon as they rescue him, he's like, yes, I'll be back. Entonces, no, no, a ver, a lo mejor estuve dos semanas sin ir porque digo, si, si voy antes me van a matar. Entonces dejé dos, dos semanas o tres a... A, a volver. ¿Y quién te iba a matar? ¿Tu esposa o, o quién? ¿La familia? Bueno, en ese, momen, en ese momento estaba separado. Ahora tengo otra pareja, uh -huh. pero tenía los hijos. Yo pasaba bastante... Estaba bastante preocupado por mis dos hijos. <risa> tenía una niña de nueve años entonces y el chico de unos quince en ese so momento. So, after this incident took place, he wanted to go back immediately, but said, I'm going to give it at least two weeks or my kids are going to kill me. So, uh... <risa> Solamente esperaste dos semanas. Ya, no pudiste más. Dos semanas ya tengo que volver porque... Sí, sí. Entonces, <risa> claro, yo, yo digo... A partir de entonces... Uh, estás como más preocupado porque si te vuelves otra vez a perder en una cueva de estas... Entonces ya dirán... Chisco, gracias, se ha vuelto a perder en una cueva y tal. Entonces digo, ostras, es que no va, no va a venirme nadie a rescatar. Pero sí, entonces... Uh, Yeah. So, me ha sorprendido que después de cinco años todavía hasta ver vosotros mismos y un, un documental que están haciendo aquí la televisión también autonómica uh, parece me, no nunca me hubiese creído que hubiese llegado a tener tanta difusión y tanta cobertura mediática wow so he said that uh, you know after going back to cave diving the thing in his mind was if I get lost again they're gonna be like ah, th ah, this guy is not learning his lesson let's not even rescue him again but apparently the incident you know, kind of um, uh, got a hold of everybody's mind and people are still talking about it like us here at Dive Talk and they're even doing a documentary locally on the Mallorca, TV in Mallorca, so. Mm -hmm. Good. Um, entonces, Cisco, ¿qué, qué cosas aprendieron, eh, digamos, a, a, después de este incidente? A, a, algo que cambiaron, algo que están haciendo diferente para, digamos, proteger que si alguien se vuelve a perder de la misma manera, o lo, que, que, sea, mucha... que sea menos el chance de que se pierda, número uno, y segundo, que si se pierden sea más fácil encontrarlo. Tuvimos muchas polémicas, muchas discusiones, porque no está muy claro tampoco, porque claro, todas las cosas están muy pensadas en el peluceo para salir con las flechas, en los cruces, para poder salir, pero no para poder entrar a llegar hasta un sitio. Sobre todo en nuestras cuevas que tienen muchas ramificaciones, cuando se estás explorando, no es útil estar haciendo saltos. Es diferente cuando una cueva está acabada, si quieres poner saltos. Pero cuando estás explorando, si estás haciendo saltos, no sabes dónde está el salto, ya no te acuerdas, porque es tan, tan ramificada, que eh, son auténticos laberintos, que no es práctico hacer saltos hasta que no está acabada de explorar. Para hacer la, la exploración propia, para hacer topografía, etcétera. 
Y entonces, claro, a ver, lo suyo es ir dejando pues cookies o marcadas para saber por lo menos un mínimo hasta dónde ha llegado una persona. Pero, pero vamos, no te creas que ha habido bastante polémica respecto a cómo hacerlo, porque dicen, de todas formas, lo que te ha pasado a ti es muy difícil, lo normal es que, sea, que esté muerto, entonces no hay prisa. Uh, es complicado, pero bueno. So I asked if there's any lessons they've learned after the incident, and he said, yeah, there were a lot of discussions, and one of the things that they realized is that although it's easy to find your way out because there's arrows pointing to the exit, it's not easy to find your way in into places inside the cave when there's so many ramifications in a cave that goes in all directions. So what they're trying to do now is that, you know, when a cave is explored, and we've talked about this before on the show, we leave cookies to be able to say, you know, where people went, and you can follow literally the cookies all the way uh, down the lines that people navigated in, but that is on caves that are already explored. So cave explorers like Cisco weren't doing this. They were just exploring and not leaving cookies behind. So they said that after the incident, they started doing that. They started leaving cookies to help um, you know, on on finding uh, if something gets lost, if someone gets lost. But the challenge is, is that most people say that he was just lucky that he found an air pocket because in a case like this where somebody couldn't find the jump and gets lost or whatever, they would have drowned. So there's no rush. Uh, on on trying to find them, so not everyone, not every cave explorer is actually leaving cookies. Esta vez me tocó a mí. Yo otras veces había había participado en en autorescates de compañeros que se habían extraviado, que no habían salido, y en el 2002 tuve la desgracia de participar en la recuperación de un cadáver de un espeluzador que murió ahogado por porque entró en pánico en una cueva muy estrecha. So he uh, he has actually recovered bodies of people in caves, like in 2002, where a diver went into a tight cave and panicked and drowned. Esta vez me tocó a mí, pero, pero bueno. Seguimos. Eh, siempre, se aprende, siempre se aprende de los errores. Yeah. Pero yo te digo, fue una, una acumulación de muchos factores, mm -hmm. muchas, muchos factores negativos. Tuve la suerte después de poder sobrevivir, pero la, el incidente... Si hubiera habido buena visibilidad o no se hubiera roto aquella piedra en aquella instalación que no era la que nosotros nos imaginábamos, si no, el compañero no hubiera llegado hasta donde tenía el tercer tanque. Es decir, son muchas cosas que se fueron sumando. Yeah, so it was a combination of things, and if one of those things wouldn't have happened, we would have probably not had this incident. Um, bueno, Cisco, muchas gracias por, por este, estar en el programa y por explicar qué fue lo que pasó, porque queríamos entender un poco más acerca de de digamos del incidente y cómo, cómo llegaron a un punto donde tenían aire muy bajo pues eso fue una de las cosas que no no se explicó muy bien en el video no, no se explicó muy bien cómo ustedes llegan a un punto en que no tengo aire y tengo que estar en este en este hueco no eh, entonces mm. bueno muchas gracias por eso y lo segundo es cuándo podemos venir a Mallorca para ir a bucear en las cuevas estas que, que ustedes están explorando <risa> No creas que también es complicado porque el muchas están protegidas, entonces hay que hacer proyectos de estudio, hay que poner quienes participan. Uh, el precio de protegerlas a veces es un poco alto porque hay mucha burocracia, pero, pero bueno, uh, se puede. So I said, thank you for being on the show and explaining everything that happened. I wanted to understand how they ran out of air and ended up in an air pocket because that's not common with with cave divers obviously we respect the the rules of thirds uh and i'll also ask him when can we come to mallorca and and dive but apparently you need permits and is you know bureaucracy and it's just complicated so uh, i don't know if that's ever going to happen but you know we'll see we'll see where it goes bueno sí con muchas gracias eh, vamos a dejar a la gente con otro video de otra gente que se ha perdido en cuevas también que hay, hay una persona en, en Croacia que o sea, aparentemente él pasó casi lo mismo que te pasó a ti. Se perdió una cueva, consiguió un agujero de aire y se clavó un cuchillo en el corazón. No sé por qué. Ostras, no, esperó, no esperó ni siquiera dos horas. Fue de una. Uf. Entonces, Perfecto. sí. El, la, la pregunta que yo tuve cuando hice ese video fue ¿qué, qué cuchillos carga la gente? Porque los cuchillos que yo cargo uh -huh. no sirven para nada. Si yo quisiera, uh -huh. si yo quisiera hacer algo así... Entonces, pues no sé cuál cuchillo es el que tú tienes, pero eh, los míos no, no hacen eso. No sé. eh, pero sí, muchas gracias por estar en el programa y, y pues nos vemos. Gracias a vosotros por, por invitarme. Hasta luego. Hasta luego. So that was it. 
That was a conversation with Cisco. Hopefully it wasn't too drawn because of the whole translating back and forward. But uh, I wanted to get through all those details because you never know, man. You never know if it ever happens to you, what you're going to be thinking about, you know, when that happens to you, getting to his mindset. I think that he's very, very strong mentally, obviously, to be able to just sit there without even be able to see a, like a, a clock, a watch, like be able to, to know that an hour went by because... You know, like to me, depending on what I'm doing, an hour can feel like a day or it can feel like a minute. So um, that was super, super interesting. But, you know, what happened to Cisco getting, you know, finding an air pocket, being close to being out of air and finding an air pocket, even though, you know, the 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 quality of the air that he was breathing in this air pocket was poor for him to just sit there for days and wait for help, even though he contemplated potentially saying, look, if I'm going to die in a few weeks of a starvation i will probably kill myself first he never really acted upon that which is what i i feel that i would do obviously it's hard because i've never been in a situation like that it's hard to say what you're gonna actually do when it really happens to you everybody thinks they can do something and then when it actually happens they do the complete opposite but uh, the way i feel about it is look i'm gonna i'm not gonna quit i'm not gonna give up um and and just like stop myself like it happened to the story of the diver in croatia which, again, even though <laughs> Cisco had basically the same thing happen, below on air, found an air pocket, he decided to stay and wait it out. Now, I know some of you are going to have a problem with that. Some of you are going to say, yeah, but Cisco was a trained caver and cave diver or whatever. We've had other people on the show. We've covered other stories of divers that found an air pocket and waited and waited and waited until somebody came and found them. So, yeah, we've taken a lot of feedback. People have a problem with me saying that this guy found an air pocket and immediately stabbed himself in the heart. Makes no sense. It still makes no sense, right? And if you look at that story, it took, it didn't take days for them to go find the body. It was immediately, within an hour, they were already looking for this guy and he was already dead. He already had stabbed himself in the heart. Does that make any sense? It doesn't make any sense still to this day. And I'm not saying that it's impossible. I'm just saying there are other options. There are other explanations to how they can find this guy. And he had a stab in the heart. Could be other things. Keep an open mind. There's more than one explanation. But uh, if you haven't seen that video, I'm going to leave it right here. So you can click on it. Check it out. Tell me what you think about it. Because it still doesn't make any sense. Multiple stories later, not sold yet. We'll see you on the next one.